Good afternoon. I'm Rebecca Blank. I'm the Dean here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the last um, seminar of the Science, Technology, and Public Policy program this semester. Um, I'm particularly I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to this seminar, since our own Shabita Parthasarathy is going to be speaking. It's always a delight to um, celebrate a book launch by one of our own faculty members, and particularly when it's a first book. I, I saw Shabita in the hallway sort of caressing, caressing this book the first day she got it. You know, those of us who've had first books all know what that feels like. Um, so we're in for a treat. We'll get to hear about it. Um, I'm just here to start things off. I'm going to turn things over to John Carson um, in order to introduce Shabita. John is an associate professor in the Department of History, and he's director of the program in Science, Technology, and Society here at the University of Michigan. John. Thank you, Becky. <clears throat> well, welcome, everybody. This is a really great pleasure, I have to say, before I do my formal introduction, that I've gotten to see aspects of this project for a very long time. It's been really wonderful to watch someone who's already at the forefront of scholarship, um, who I saw actually as a graduate student at one point, and who has already stood out there as someone to, uh, as a person to watch. And clearly, that was completely justified in what, in what we have before us today. Um, some formal bits. Shobina Pratasarathi is an assistant professor at the Gerald R. School, or Gerald, or Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy here at UM, as you all know, and co-director, in fact, really one of the first founding co-director of the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program, as well as a core member of my own Science, Technology, and Society Program, in fact, a very important member of that. Her research interests are wonderfully broad, eschewing concentration on a single national context, She'll be the works on the comparative politics of science and technology in the United States, the UK, and the EU, with a particular focus on issues related, related to genetics and biotechnology and contemporary international patenting regimes, with the focus of her most recent work. At Michigan, she'll be the teacher's courses on science, technology, and public policy, genetics and biotechnology, and the politics of policymaking. She'll be doing her graduate work at Cornell in the Department of Science and Technology Studies and has subsequently been awarded a number of prestigious fellowships and grants, really a truly stunning list, in fact, including postdoctoral fellowships at Northwestern and UCLA and research grants from the Wellcome Trust and, the United, and Michigan's own Ethics in Public Life program. Next year, she will be a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars as well as <clears throat> at the Max Planck Institute, one of the Max Planck Institutes in Germany. Impressively prolific for a scholar in such an early phase of her career, she'll beat this publication span the STS and policy world. She's the author of six major articles, including Knowledge is Power, 2003, and How Users Matter, and Architectures of Genetic Medicine, 2005, in Social Science Studies and Science. She's also been, she published a numerous book reviews, case studies, and advisory committee reports. A really impressive variety. Today, however, we are gathered to celebrate one publication in particular. Her eagerly awaited new book, which I get to point out <laughs> to multitudes, Building Genetic Medicine, Breast Cancer Technology and the Comparative Politics of Healthcare, MIT Press, April, this very month, 2007, which of course will be conveniently available for purchase, and we expect you all to do that at the end of the presentation. There will be a reception afterwards. I'm sure she'll be, will be happy to sign the book, and we will all urge as many people who can to buy what is a wonderful book. As we will hear today, in Building Genetic Medicine, she'll be the compares the development of genetic testing for breast cancer, particularly for BRCA1 and 2, in the United States and Britain, in order to investigate how national contexts shape both regulatory mechanisms and the development and deployment of new technologies. It is my distinct pleasure to congratulate Shubita on her wonderful accomplishment and to ask her to share some of her work with us all today. Shubita. Thanks, John, for that amazing introduction. I'm quite sure that I won't be able to live up to the hype, but I will certainly give it a try. And thanks also for giving my book back I will keep it safely <laughs> under my pillow tonight, as I have been every night since I received the book. I don't know what I'm hoping it turns into, but, um, you know, we can always dream. Uh, so as John said, today I'm going to be talking about my book, which, uh, as he suggested, is about the development of genetic testing for breast cancer in the United States and in Britain. 
And what I thought I would do today is start out by putting that project into some context, into a larger context around the politics of science and technology, and then focusing in a little bit on one piece of the overall work. And you know, as John, of course, said, hopefully that'll entice you to uh, want to read more. Uh, so genetic testing for breast cancer was one controversial technology that emerged in the mid-1990s. But as many of you probably know from reading the newspapers, magazines, uh, watching TV, listening to the radio, science and technology, new advancements in science and technology are increasingly controversial among the public, whether you're talking about cloning technologies, nanotechnologies, genetically modified organisms, the list goes on and on, and so too does the public controversy around all of these new advancements. And one, many, I've, I've been asked many times, both in classes and in and lectures that I give, why is it, why is it that all of a sudden uh, the public seems to be more engaged in science and, and technology development and also science and technology policy making in general? And of course, some people see this as a, a wonderful move in terms of increased democratic involvement. Many see it as a problem that sort of, you know, the public all of a sudden is mucking up the works in an arena of policy that they, until pretty recently, have not been engaged in. But in general, I think that this increased public concern in science and technology development has to do with a number of things. First of all, it's that science and technology are increasingly part of our everyday lives, right? It's in the way we eat the kinds of foods that we choose to consume, the drugs that we take, uh, the way we communicate with one another, the way we listen to music, the health and beauty products that we use. In every factor of our lives, in every part of our lives, we're dealing with science and technology. And of course, with increased use of science and technology, we're also increasingly faced with ruptures in terms of our trust in the science and technology establishment. Of course, with more use, there are more opportunities for problems and potential disasters, right? And if you go through the decades, you have in the 1970s, Three Mile Island, Exelon Valdez in the 1980s. In the 1990s, across the pond, you have mad cow disease and questions around whether and what the British government knew about uh, what the disease was and, and what they did or did not do about it. You have the uh, blood scandal in France, the, tainted, the blood that was tainted with HIV. So you have all of these ruptures in terms of uh, the scientific and technological establishment and questions around what you can and can't trust about science and technology and what kinds of risk new advancements in science and technology pose. In addition to that, there are questions increasingly about what is the kind of unknown power that science and technology bring. And of course, the most obvious examples of that today are questions around stem cells and cloning and what might happen if we allow uh, cloning technologies, for example, to be run rampant. What might the implications of that be? We're also wondering about not just what are the immediate safety risks of new science and technology, but also how science and technology might influence our traditional values, ways we go about seeing the world and interacting with one another, our conceptions of you know, intractable approaches to religion, how those kinds of things might shift as well. And so I think when you know, we think about science and technology in 2007, we're talking about an interaction that's profoundly ambivalent. On the one hand, we see tremendous promise and hope. And on the other hand, of course, we are worried about what the challenges these each new advancement might bring. Genetic medicine is perhaps a, an arena that is most representative of both the promise and challenges of uh, new science and technology. And I just want to note that, that that Time magazine cover is from 1970. So this is a discussion and a debate that's been happening for well over 30 years. And it's not entirely clear to me that we've answered any of these questions in a definitive way. But we certainly, as I'll argue today, have answered them in a de facto way. And I think it's worth thinking about what the implications of that are. But in general, when we think about what genetic medicine has to bring us, you know, there are a number of things. So the first is that we'll be able to engage in better diagnostics, that DNA testing can give us a better idea of what disease you actually have. And that's traditionally what, um, in the early days of DNA testing, 
what it really could do. The second, and breast cancer genetic testing fits into this category, is predicting our future of disease risk. What might happen to us 20, 30 years from now? What does our DNA tell us about our future? Third, and this is beyond genetic testing, but you know, sort of moving into the world of what might happen in, uh, in future decades is the possibility of engineering out harmful diseases. These things are starting to happen with the availability of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, taking embryos out of the womb in the process of in vitro fertilization, doing DNA testing, and then choosing what kinds of embryos you actually want to implant in the uterus and bring to term. But the questions are about whether or not we can actually get rid of certain diseases. And I'll just foreshadow that, in fact, this is available for the genes that I'll be talking about today. And I'm not going to talk too much about that, but after what I tell you today, I think you might um, have some interesting questions about, about what that means. And finally, the, another sort of potential on the horizon is the availability of drugs that are literally targeted to your DNA. And that's, you know, sort of the, the promise of what's called pharmacogenomics, but the hope is that someday, in fact, you don't have to take a drug that may have different side effects based on your individual makeup, that in fact you'll be able to take something that was made for you. Of course, with all of this wonderful promise in terms of getting rid of diseases on such a wide scale, genetic medicine also raises a number of very serious challenges and a number of very serious questions. Among them are, first of all, the worries that, in fact, there will be the creation of a new genetic underclass, that genetic technologies will be available to people who can afford them uh, that, you know, for thousands and thousands of dollars, and those people will be able to engineer out diseases, but that, at the end of the day, the people who are on the lower ends of the socioeconomic spectrum who can't afford basic health care certainly won't be able to afford these kinds of designer genetic technologies and that there'll actually be a greater split between rich and poor and that there'll be the creation of what many refer to as a genetic underclass. There are also concerns, and these are probably concerns that many of you have heard about, they're concerns about the privacy of genetic information. If you generate genetic information about your own DNA makeup, then what happens to that information? Should it be given to your employer? Should it be given to your insurer? I'm not sure what Becky would have thought if a profile of my DNA makeup had been given to her along with uh, my CV, but you know, those are the kinds of questions that people are worrying about. What are the implications for families? That's another issue around privacy. So if you find out that you have a disease-causing mutation, are you under an obligation to tell your sister or your daughter? And what if your sister or daughter never really wanted to know that information in the first place? There's also concerns about genetic reductionism, that you know, we will assume that everything about you is really contained in your DNA and that every answer is really there, so we don't really need to know anything about where you grew up, your personality, that at the end of the day, all uh, Becky would have needed to know when she hired me was information about my DNA makeup. Finally, a couple of other things. Environmental causation is another question that people worry is getting subsumed into a you know, in this broader discussion around genetic information. That, again, with a focus on genetics, we're forgetting about the fact that there are all of these other potential things going on, that environment matters as well, and that, in fact, genetics as a causative factor is actually overhyped, and that genetics doesn't actually have the kinds of major implications on us, on our propensity to get diseases, our propensity to behave the way that we do, and that we're actually focusing too much on the genetics and not enough on much more complicated factors, whether it's the environment, socioeconomic dimensions, structural dimensions in terms of where we choose to live, and that actually we should be spending a lot more money on that. And that that might have long-term implications. Our choice of funding, for example, focusing on genetics research and developing technologies uh, towards focused on the genome that we're forgetting about all of these other extremely important things. So, Within this picture of genetic medicine and generally within this picture of sort of ambivalence towards science and technology, I think a pretty important question has to come up, and that is how do 
how should societies deal with public concerns over technology? So if the publics are, public is worried both about uh, the, prom the potential challenges of new technologies, but also sort of romanced by the promise, how should policymakers, how should contemporary societies deal with this in the process of technological development? Now, traditionally, the way that we answer this question, over the, certainly over the last 30 years, has been to say, OK, well, we'll have a discussion about it. We'll talk about it in the media. We'll have lots of advisory commissions to discuss the issues. But when, it, when push comes to shove, it hasn't really had major regulatory effects, as I'll uh, describe to you uh, today. And in addition, it hasn't really shaped technological development in a really profound way either. And what I argue in the book using genetic testing for breast cancer as a case study is that, in fact, discussions about implications should be had in the context of technical development. And that, in fact, implications of these new technologies and the kinds of you know, sort of dealing with the challenges that, in this case, genetic medicine poses, actually are often answered to a great extent in the process of building the technologies themselves. And if we wait until a technology is already around, that the horse has already left the barn. So that's another important thing. Uh, that's an important, what I hope is an important contribution that this book makes. So just to give you a sense of where I'm going, uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of the breast cancer gene discoveries. And I should say, these are, breast, these are genes, the BRCA genes are linked to both breast and ovarian cancer. Uh, I often will refer to them as the breast cancer genes, and that's because they're generally thought of as the breast cancer genes. And I talk about this in the book, but it, it, I think it is an interesting question of why it is that they've come to be known as the breast cancer genes, because they're equally important in terms of um, ovarian cancer issues. But of course, less people have ovarian cancer. And to be quite cynical about it, there isn't a political constituency attached to ovarian cancer in the way that there is to breast cancer. So that's something to keep in mind. So I'll basically give you a summary of the book and then talk to you a little bit about um, one slice of the book, and that is, in particular, how the development of the technology in the US and Britain have shaped different ideas around risk, disease, and treatment for having inherited cancer susceptibility in the US and Britain, and then talk a little bit about conclusions and implications of uh, the study. So the development of genetic testing for breast and ovarian cancer really embodies a collision of, on the one hand, one of the most serious medical problems that we have in contemporary societies, particularly contemporary Western societies, and that is breast cancer. And I would argue that it's both a medical and a social problem. And it's colliding with one of the most exciting, and many would use the word revolutionary, scientific breakthroughs of our time, and that is genetics. So it's not entirely surprising that the development of genetic testing for breast cancer and the discoveries of genes linked to breast cancer were very highly anticipated. And as I'll say and just to talk about in just a second, we're really uh, involved in international race to find the genes linked to uh, breast and ovarian cancer. So many of you probably already know these statistics, but breast cancer is a very common disease in contemporary societies, and as I said, particularly in contemporary Western societies. The um, picture that you have there from Time Magazine is from 1992, I believe, and they say at that time, one in 10 American women will get breast cancer. Now the statistic is one in eight. Uh, and while over you know, the last 30 or 40 years where there's been increasing attention to cancer, and in particular over the last 20 years when there's been really intense attention to breast cancer, there have been improvements in terms of um, longevity once someone gets breast cancer. There have been improvements in diagnostics and treatments. But we, have, we are very far from solving the breast cancer problem. And in fact, often it seems like we'll take one step forward and we'll take half a step back or even a full step back. Uh, just last week, for example, in the New York Times, they reported that uh, there are new studies that show that what they had hoped was a new way of reading mammograms actually causes more problems because it often causes more false positive results than um, than regular mammographic readings. So this is a constant problem. And the incidences of breast cancer in Britain are about the same. It's about 1 in 12 uh, women in the UK. 
Now, in this context, I mentioned that breast cancer is a, uh, has become very politicized, particularly in the United States. Uh, since the early 1990s, a number of patient advocacy groups have coalesced around the issue of breast cancer and have been very successful in the US in particular in being able to increase funding for breast cancer research by about 900%. So today, uh, you know, there are, there's about $800 million that's devoted specifically to breast cancer research alone. And one of the interesting elements of it is that, in fact, a large proportion of this comes from the Department of Defense. These breast cancer advocates were able to uh, go to the Department of Defense and figure out a way to get the DOD at a time when uh, its budget was being cut. They were able to uh, convince the Department of Defense to demonstrate its utility by funding breast cancer research. So there is considerable patient advocacy around breast cancer, which uh, has had, a, I think, a pretty important influence on uh, the attention to the disease. And many people say that it's now you know, out of proportion with, the, with uh, the amount of incidence. But it's very serious, and they've had great success, as I said. Now there's considerable research effort into the, um, into the uh, uh, breast cancer prevention, detection, and treatment efforts as well. So within this context of you know, a lot of political attention, high profiles, a very serious medical problem, discoveries f of genes that were linked to breast cancer were, of course, very highly anticipated. And in the 1980s and 1990s, there was what was referred to often as an international race to find the breast cancer gene. So scientists in Japan, Germany, France, the UK, the US, Canada um, were involved, and they all wanted to find these genes that were linked to inherited susceptibility to breast and ovarian cancer. They probably anticipated that, of course, there would be major rewards in terms of prestige, but also, of course, probably major financial rewards as well. And in the mid-1990s, in 1994 and 1995, the breast cancer 1 and 2 genes were found, known as BRCA1 and BRCA2. Now, these genes at the time were thought to be linked to about 5 to 10 percent of all breast cancers. Uh, nowadays, they say actually that it's closer to 5 percent. And these genes were linked to an increased risk of contracting breast or ovarian cancer. So it didn't mean necessarily that you would get the disease. And in fact, you know, there was a huge range. It was, at the time, people said up to 85% average lifetime risk of getting breast cancer in particular. Uh, now there are cases where you could have a gene mutation and you don't get the disease. And of course, you could, you have breast cancer and most breast cancers are not due to one of these genes. However, given the excitement over genetics and the concerns about breast cancer, worries about um, the breast cancer genes are quite significant. In fact, you know, I've often given talks and people think that, you know, somehow breast cancer, the breast cancer genes or the genetics of breast cancer is uh, responsible for a lot more breast cancer than what it actually is. And I think that that's an important uh, part of the story because then when the discussion began in the mid-1990s around how to develop a genetic test for breast and ovarian cancer, they were, you know, uh, physicians and policymakers were talking about um, a real large potential demand, right? Because if everyone who has any uh, concern about breast cancer is thinking about taking this test, then you're talking about a huge number of people, of course. Uh, and, but at the same time, this is a, a set of breast cancer genes that is kind of uncertain, right? I mean, you, it's only related to a small proportion of all breast cancers. And at the same time, you could have a bracket mutation, and it doesn't actually cause disease incidence. And this is sort of a new, this is what's called predictive genetic testing. It's a different kind of genetic testing than what I was telling you about before, the sort of more traditional, you know, you have a disease, and it's used more in a diagnostic way. So this kind of predictive genetic testing raised an a new set of questions in terms of how to build these technologies. And in the book overall, I go over how this new technology, bracket testing, uh, developed. And I show how it's different in the US and UK. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those differences today. But I account for these differences in a number of ways, both structural and cultural. I mean, obviously, as both of you probably know, in the US and UK, they have very different approaches to healthcare, 
you know, pretty different political systems and ways of dealing with scientific and medical expertise, but there are also more, more subtle things going on, issues around different approaches, for example, to patient advocacy and different histories of patient advocacy, different ideas about the appropriate relationship between science and industry. Those kinds of things, I argue, also played an important role in the way that the two technologies developed very differently in the US and in Britain. And I make a few arguments. The first is that national context influences technology development. Second, that the ways the technologies are developed in the two countries actually influence the implications of the technology. I talked about that already a little bit. They influence the rights, the roles, responsibilities of the people who are actually using the test and engaged with it, and as I'm going to talk about more today, defines risk, treatment, and, uh, disease, and the way disease is de defined. And then finally, I talk about what happens when the American provider of the test goes to Britain and uses its patent rights, uh, as is, it's you know, accustomed to do in the US, uh, and it uses its patent rights to try to force the British to uh, accede to its testing system and shut down its indigenous testing system. And what I demonstrate is the British opposition to that, and actually a more widespread European opposition to that. And what I argue there is that all the things that I've talked about throughout the book, the ties to national context, the way in which these technologies are embedded in particular social and political systems influences its ability to simply easily transport or engage in transnational technology transfer. And what I hope is that those, that kind of analysis demonstrates why often there seem to be increasingly uh, controversies around transnational technology transfer. Another obvious example is, of course, genetically modified organisms, which, you know, perhaps not as controversially in the, uh, controversial in the U.S., but lo and behold, when a ship carrying genetically modified soybeans tries to dock on British shores, it becomes a major international incident. So <clears throat> I'm going to start by um, talking about the U.S. case, and then I'll move on to compare it to the British. So in terms of the initial development of genetic medicine in the US, basically genetic medicine, and particularly clinical genetics, basically physicians taking family pedigrees and m mapping out your family history, began in the 1940s or so, and it was based in hospitals. So you had physicians doing this kind of work. But by the 1970s, when DNA testing became available, there were more and more labs attached to these clinics, and then Again, not surprisingly, given the American environment, these labs began to spin off. And so there have been an increase in commercial labs in the US and a split between the activities of the laboratory and the activities of the clinic. They've almost operated in, in very separate domains. And that's an important dimension uh, that I'll return to later in the talk. The Clinical Laboratories Improvement Act, uh, which is part of the Department of Health and Human Services, does regulate this kind of testing to some degree, but they only regulate what happens in the laboratory. So when you split the laboratory and the clinic, really all they're focusing on is what's happening in the laboratory, and even that they only do to a small extent, because a lot of genetic tests are really sort of really minor, one-off genetic tests that are for complicated genes, and it's being done in a random research lab, and that research lab may or may not know that they're subject to this regulation, so they don't actually then get regulated by um, by this act. On the other hand, the clinical dimensions of testing are basically unregulated in the US. So the Food and Drug Administration has been encouraged on numerous occasions to step in in a greater way in the US, but they've been reluctant to stifle what they say is a growing industry, especially when they say that a lot of these are these little research labs, and if they try to go after these and, and create a, a regulatory framework that it'll be too burdensome and it'll shut down some of these small testing uh, laboratories and as well, you know, genetics clinics in, in hospitals who won't be able to withstand this kind of regulatory burden. And in addition, of course, the Food and Drug Administration and the U.S. government in general has not been very happy about the idea of regulating physicians. We don't really have a precedent for that in the U.S. We've kind of stayed out of it. And genetic testing sort of raises these questions about what role should a clinician play in 
talking to their patients about these kinds of uncertainty questions that I was raising before, uh, the psychosocial dimensions involved in you know, whether or not you should uh, get this test, but also whether or not you should tell family members, all of those new kinds of challenges that are raised with genetic testing often have raised the question about whether or not we should regulate what happens in the clinic, but we don't really have a precedent for that. So uh, that's one thing that we have also continued to be reluctant to do. Within this environment, a number of genetic testing for breast cancer providers emerged. And uh, one provider eliminated its competition and did so pretty quickly and, uh, you know, with, with, you know, with, uh, with what is, again, not a surprising method, and that is that they used patent rights to do it, basically. So they had a very strong financial position, and they had also applied for patents on the genes. They were responsible, this company, Myriad Genetics, was responsible for finding the first breast cancer gene, and they had applied for patents on it, and then basically, you know, there were a number of providers. They basically went in and they uh, shut down all the rest of the providers using their, their patent rights to do it. Now, as I, as I intimated, and I'd be happy to talk about this more in the question, you know, they tried a similar strategy in Britain, but the Brits basically said, yeah, we don't believe in patenting genes. So, that, I mean, that's a very, very uh, um, flippant way of putting it, but that's one of the major tropes that uh, occurred when they tried to go to Britain. But anyway, they were successful in the United States, and they created a test that was in some uh, consumer product uh, DNA analysis. So they, what they were really offering was a state-of-the-art DNA testing uh, technology. It was marketed quite widely, and it was available to any, any patient or consumer, as, as they really were in this case, through uh, any physician. And no specialized genetic counseling was required. So again, sort of taking advantage of the split between laboratory and clinical services, they said, listen, we're just a laboratory, so, and we want to offer this test, which is an important test for an important high-profile disease. We want to offer it as widely as possible. So we're going to not restrict its uh, availability in any way. The prices for the tests range from $250 to $4,000, depending on the test that you get. But the most common, which is a full sequence analysis of both genes to check for mutations, is about $3,000. And that's not an insignificant amount because many people concerned about privacy issues are worried about asking their insurer to pay for it, so they're paying for it out of pocket, which then goes back to questions, by the way, around you know, the, the genetic underclass that I was immer uh, talking about before. And in fact, in addition to um, not having their physician uh, know about it and not getting this information put into the medical record, uh, the consumer actually decide, can decide which physician uh, gets results. And in my interviews, I often spoke to people at genetics clinics who said that people would come in and give aliases or you know, try to go to genetics clinics away from their physician so that the information would actually not get back uh, to their primary care physician and not be put in their medical record. So, and I just, you know, I brought a prop. This is a case, this is uh, one of the uh, genetic testing kits that's provided, and I think it encapsulates the approach pretty well, right? I mean, it's a sort of box that you can get, you know, shipped to the physician, your know, blood is drawn, it's shipped back to Myriad. Um, in terms of it being sort of a, a real consumer product, I think that's a pretty, you know, that you can buy, there you go, here's the box, you can buy it anytime. So within that context, what happens once you get a genetic test? Well. You can have a few kinds of results. First is obviously you can test negative for a BRCA gene mutation. That of course doesn't mean that you're not at risk for breast cancer, it just means that you're at the same level of risk as the rest of the population. Second, you can have a positive test result and that means that you're of course at risk of getting breast or ovarian cancer sometime in the future. And that's actually one classification. So they are not yet at the stage, um, they weren't in 1996 when the test was initially offered, and now they, so we still haven't done enough research to actually give you specific information about what each mutation does or how that mutation might uh, operate in your family. So what they generally do is they give you one risk classification, even though you know, the mutation is likely to operate differently in, you know, different mutations are likely to operate differently and each mutation is likely to operate differently in uh, different families. 
One of the things that's interesting about the way Myriad Genetics talks about this technology is that they emphasize uh, that if you have a positive gene mutation, you have a particular disease, and that is the disease of inherited cancer susceptibility. Now, it's not entirely surprising, of course, that a company who is interested in selling you access to this box uh, would want to also construct a particular disease, right? And that is the disease of inherited cancer susceptibility. And it's a disease of inherited cancer susceptibility that's linked to a very specific kind of breast and ovarian cancer, and that's hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. And they, again, make a point of saying in their promotional materials and their educational materials for physicians that you don't need to have a family history to have the disease of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, right? Or the disease of inherited cancer susceptibility. Now, one would ask, but it wouldn't matter. I mean, if you don't have a, a family history, then you probably aren't going to get the disease. But they're interested in making that distinction, right? Because, again, it reinforces the utility of their test. Now, of course, for most people, I, you, know, you, you either get a question wrong or you get a question right. However, in this case, there is a third category, and that is that you could have what's called a variant of uncertain significance. And a variant of uncertain significance means that they found an alteration in your uh, BRCA gene, but they don't know whether or not it's actually a mutation or not. And that used to happen in about 20% of all cases. It's now about down to 10% of all cases. Um, and that's actually because a French group uh, who is not uh, beholden to the patent issues in the U.S. did some work and found that, that part of that was re a result of um, some of the mutations that Myriad was missing. And so now they've incorporated that reluctantly into their, into their uh, testing system. But uh, it's still about 10% of all results. And what does it mean, then, if you have what's called a variant of uncertain significance? It means, in essence, that you're at risk of being at risk, right? So it's yet another risk classification, and it's a risk classification, again, that's defined by the DNA. So here you have really a set of uh, risk classifications that are built on a particular approach to the technology, right? When you focus on the DNA analysis, then the risk classifications are based on what the DNA has to tell you. And furthermore, of course, not only is that a byproduct of Myriad's testing system in that way, but it is also, many argue, a byproduct of the fact that you know, this is a technology that was offered immediately after the genes were discovered because you don't really have to do much work once you can sequence the genes to find them, then you can sequence the genes to find a mutation. Uh, and so that's no problem. But many people argue, actually, if you had waited and there had been a lengthy regulatory approval process, then you might have narrowed the number of variants of uncertain significance somewhat, and you wouldn't have, you know, in the early days, 20% and perhaps even now 10% uh, of these kinds of cases. Now, within this category, how do you treat those people that are testing positive for a BRCA mutation? There are three different potential options available. The first is that you can have increased surveillance, increased uh, mammography, really. Uh, the, the screening options available for ovarian cancer are considered to be not very good. Uh, the second is prophylactic surgery, either uh, mastectomy or oophorectomy. Of course, those are pretty drastic measures. And finally, uh, chemo prevention, in particular tamoxifen. And I'll talk about this a little. It's very interesting in comparative perspective. But basically, the genes were discovered in, uh, as I said, in 94 and 95. And around that time, there was a transnational study being done to test whether or not tamoxifen was a useful drug among women who are at high risk for breast cancer. And in 1998, the Americans stopped the trial early and decided that, in fact, it had clear uh, benefits. And the FDA uh, approved it in an expedited fashion. And what was very interesting about that, again, going back to the sort of production of the utility of the test, was that n a number of the investigators involved in the study talked explicitly about how, you know, now we have this diagnostic test, right? We need to do something with the people who are diagnosed with this, you know, inherited cancer susceptibility. And neither mammography nor prophylactic surgery are appropriate measures. And this is, in essence, a magic bullet, right? Uh, so that was definitely one of the, one of the sort of 
important pieces of rhetoric around the expedited approval um, of this drug. Now, of course, the study started in 1992 before they had uh, discovered the breast cancer gene, so it didn't, you know, just because you were in the study doesn't, you, you were actually put in the study because of familial risk, not because of the presence or absence of a BRCA mutation. Uh, and so that's an interesting element. And I'll actually just say as an aside that since then they've taken that cohort, they've taken out the number of people, they found the people who have BRCA mutations, uh, they've tested them and they've actually found that it really has equivocal benefit. However, it is still prescribed uh, as a chemopreventive option for people who are at risk. So it's sort of, you know, in the desperate times call for desperate measures mode of uh, prov provision of treatment. So moving on to the British case, uh, initially the Brits offered genetic medicine in a very similar approach to the United States through hospitals. And then as the NHS uh, ramped up in the late 1940s and early 1950s and 1960s, the uh, genetics clinics were incorporated into regional national health service authorities. So every region, um, and the number of regions has increased, uh, now it's around 18 NHS regions across the country, has a regional genetics clinic. And this uh, regional genetics clinic offers both laboratory and clinical services. So in, exact, you know, in an exactly opposite way to the US where uh, they split off, in the UK, laboratory and clinical services are really kept together. And there aren't private genetics clinics or private laboratories. That's starting to change now. But um, in terms of bracket testing, that remains the case. And of course, not surprisingly, given uh, the National Health Service, there are a couple of things that are, you know, that are not going to be at all uh, shocking to you. The first is that equal access is a very important priority and continues to be in terms of the provision of genetic services. And there is regional administration, but there's also national administration. And so you have de facto regulation of laboratory and clinical services in that way, right? So because they, the national and regional health authorities are the ones funding these services, and so they're deciding what they're going to fund and what they're not going to fund, and so therefore uh, influencing what kinds of technologies are available and how they're made available. And not surprisingly, again, predictive testing uh, raised the same kinds of issues around who should have access to testing, uh, how, how much of this should be funded, and in particular questions or, you know, that were raised in a different way in the US got raised in Britain as well. So, you know, this is a test that should be available for healthy women. What are we really telling them? How should we, you know, provide this technology that may or may not have clinical benefit? Those are the kinds of questions that got asked because, of course, at the end of the day, the National Health Service has to pay for the test, which is expensive, but then they also have to deal with these women, you know, when they get or don't get cancer in the long run. So, of course, their set of concerns is different than the set of concerns uh, that we see in the U.S., and this comes up, you'll see again, um, both in terms of the development of genetic testing for breast cancer, but also in terms of the definition of the option, treatment options available. So how did BRCA testing develop within this context? Initially, it was administered in a pretty haphazard fashion, and different regional health authorities offered the technology in different ways. However, a number of scientists and public health officials realized that genetic testing for breast cancer was likely to be a model case, uh, not only for predictive genetic testing, but also for dealing with genetic medicine in general. And so they lobbied for the creation of a national system. And they decided to do what's, again, not at all surprising given the British environment, that is to create a national system of risk assessment and triage. And here, in comparison to the US, where Myriad really diminished the importance of family history and focused on what the DNA could tell you, in Britain, they used family history as a way of doing the triage itself. So they asked primary and secondary care physicians to make up a family history, and then they would divide individuals into low, moderate, and high risk categories depending on their family history. And individuals who are low, categorized as low risk were reassured and turned away. Individuals at moderate risk were offered access to mammographic screening, 
but they were not offered access to genetic counseling and genetic testing, the idea being that they were probably at increased risk and it was worthwhile to spend the money on mammography to keep following them, but it didn't warrant the additional uh, work that was required for counseling and DNA testing because it was pretty unlikely that they had a BRCA mutation. Individuals who are defined as at high risk were then offered access to the regional genetics clinic and DNA analysis. And they did something um, in particular, which was to test wi women who had breast or ovarian cancer first. And the reason that they did that was because they wanted to link the mutation and the disease incidence, if a mutation was actually found in the family. And the reason that they did that was because they said, listen, we don't have a lot of studies. We, you, we don't know what individual mutations do in all cases. But we want to avoid the creation of variants of uncertain significance that emerge in the US when you're focusing so much on what the DNA has to tell you. So in the British context, they said, listen, we want to focus on testing affected family members first, because then we might be able to tell you how this disease tracks in the family and what the mutation actually means in that context. Now, if you didn't have an affected family member available to be tested, that doesn't mean that it would shape, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't get access to the treatment options. You would still be in this high risk category and then have access to the high risk uh, treatment options, and I'll get to that in a second. Now, as you can tell from what I've already told you, the focus was really on what happened in the clinic. And that really contrasted but with what happened in the US, where the focus was really on what happened in the laboratory. And what's interesting is that, in fact, different regions use different laboratory methods to look for uh, these gene mutations. And they were all sort of, you know, somewhere between 90 to 100, you know, 99 percent sensitive. But the focus really wasn't on what the DNA analysis could tell you. It really was on what the clinical dimensions of this testing system were. That's really, they said, listen, at the end of the day, you know, that stuff isn't as important. It's much more important to track these individuals and to make sense of this, this DNA analysis technology in the context of counseling and risk assessment. So once you got tested in Britain, what happened to you? Well, as I said, the testing was used to refine the familial risk category. And moderate risk individuals had access to initially a mammographic screening study. Now they actually just have access to mammographic screening. Mutation positive individuals and also those who were not tested but were considered to be still high risk because they couldn't get an uh, affected family member to be tested as well, had access to two treatment op options. They had access to increased surveillance and they also had access to prophylactic surgery. Now, you notice, of course, that they didn't have access to tamoxifen. Why is that? Well, that's because, as I said before, this transnational trial that was being run was being run between the US, Britain, and Italy. And so the British and Italians were running trials at about the same time. And when the Americans stopped the trial early, the British got pretty upset, saying basically, you know, sort of lobbying all kinds of uh, uh, nefarious charges at the American researchers, but also making the point that it was very difficult in the span of six years to find out whether taking tamoxifen uh, for life was a worthwhile thing to do. And in particular, they said, listen, we're talking about giving healthy women a drug that is potentially dangerous, and we don't want to be responsible for the consequences. And here, too, you see how a National Health Service shapes an approach to the scientific evidence, right? Because in Britain, they were saying, listen, we have to pay for whatever the effects of this drug are. And if this drug has risks, then we are going to have to deal with them. Whereas, again, in a private healthcare system like ours, they don't have to deal with those kinds of issues. And so that shapes the way in which they view that scientific evidence. So the British and Italians continued their trials and actually, and I think they um, ended them in 1999 and 2000, and their trials showed basically equivocal benefit and increased risk of endometrial cancer. And then later another study showed that there was an increased risk of stroke. Now what's interesting is that those, those results were largely discounted in the United States. So, you know, one would think, and I've often asked this question, and you know, the US and Britain are pretty similar places, uh, but on these issues, it's, it's amazing how different they actually are. And that's um, what makes this study, I think, 
was made it really fun to do was that on the one hand, you would expect them to be totally similar, and on almost every scale, uh, they're quite different from one another. So the UK, and in fact all of Europe, does not allow for um, the provision of tamoxifen to high-risk women. And their argument is basically, listen, we think it might be useful, but we don't have enough evidence now, and especially, again, when we're talking about providing this drug to healthy women, we're not ready to go over that threshold at the moment. However, in the U.S., they continue to offer tamoxifen to high-risk women in general, and in particular, women who test positive for uh, BRCA mutation. So, in sum, then, what are the major differences that I've talked to you about today? Well, in the U.S., BRCA testing was really approached as a standalone DNA analysis technology with a focus on identifying people who had mutations and treating them, right? And the focus was on a technically accurate test. Um, risks were defined by the presence or absence of a gene mutation or, of course, the presence or absence of a variant of uncertain significance. And there was a construction of a new disease, new disease, actually two new diseases, a disease of inherited cancer susceptibility and also a disease of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. Now, I should say that in Britain, it's not that there's a discounting entirely of the concept of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. The issue is, however, that they just don't see an a important distinction between what they call familial breast and ovarian cancer and hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. To them, it's kind of the same thing. They, you know, the DNA analysis is simply an additional tool. It's not a separate standalone technology. So in Britain, obviously, beyond that, you have risks really de being defined by family history and a focus on what happens in the clinic. And just one more thing that I don't talk about, I didn't talk about too much today, but I think is an important element of this, is that in the U.S. I talked about the provision of genetic testing for breast and ovarian cancer really as a consumer product. And what you see is that in this, uh, in this environment, you have the patient being defined as a consumer. The physician really becomes a facilitator. So, you know, the, the, cons the consumer can shop around to a physician who's going to offer her access to this test. And so you have a relationship really there between a consumer, a facilitating physician, and the company, whereas in Britain, you have much more of a traditional doctor-patient relationship. You have a real patient um, who's also a citizen, of course, because it's a citizen within an NHS structure. And you have a physician who occupies a pretty traditional role. They're defining what that physician, what that patient has access to, what they can and can't um, uh, use in terms of DNA analysis and in terms of counseling. So, you know, it's much more of the traditional paternalistic model, whereas here we have the sort of image of the empowered consumer, but I think you see, I think in this comparison, some of the benefits and risks to both of those characterizations of the doctor-patient relationship. So then, overall, in terms of genetic testing for breast and ovarian cancer and also in terms of genetic medicine, I think that the study has a couple of important implications. The first is that the, what I say, and it's a technical term that I use in the book, a technology's architecture, that is the way that a technology is built, actually defines in large part its implications. So when we talk about implications, social and ethical implications of genetics and biotechnology, which we often do, we often don't talk about it in the context of technical issues or scientific issues. But what I'm arguing is that, in fact, we need to do that because that's where many of the implications get discussed and decided um, in a de facto way that we often don't realize and that shape uh, our futures in pretty profound ways. And actually, when we're talking about you know, a model case like genetic testing for breast and ovarian cancer, it then shapes how future genetic tests are built. So now in the U.S., for example, we have a number of genetic tests that are available uh, over the Internet. Over, um, there's actually a company that offers bracket testing uh, via, you get counseled over the phone. They sort of, it's interesting, this is a company that offers other, all other genetic tests over the internet, but they've taken a different approach to bracket testing, and I think it's probably because they know it's, it's kind of controversial if they were to just do an internet, you know, sort of internet interaction. Um, so basically, usually you, you, um, you go into the internet, you say you're interested in this test, they'll send you a box like this, it's a different company, it's called DNA Direct. 
Um, and then you talk to a counselor over the phone. For other genetic tests, you talk to them over the internet. Um, and then they'll send you the results. And then you, again, in the case of bracket testing, they talk to you over the phone. In the case of other genetic tests, they just give you the information over the internet. So, and I argue in the book that that kind of technology wouldn't exist if it weren't for um, the, the uh, structure that bracket testing, bracket testing took, because it was really a model uh, in terms of the way predictive genetic testing could be provided, and genetic testing in general. So in terms of thinking about the future of genetic medicine, I argue that we need to bring together both technical and public discussion. And I also would argue that um, this case study of one technology and one medical technology actually opens up broader discussions about the role of technology in healthcare. And you know, at the risk of sticking my foot into you know, broader conversations about healthcare reform and the future of health policy, especially with with elections coming up, I think this is an interesting question that gets raised here is that you see how all of the issues around why it is that we have the approach to medicine and healthcare that we do are embedded in this one case study and our love of technology and our interest in things new and our consumer approach to healthcare are embedded in this one story and it, at least for me, makes me ask the question of whether or not we could go to something like a single payer system when these kinds of approaches are so intractable and in fact embedded in technological design itself. And I argue that, um, obviously I argue and advocate upstream assessment of um, technologies and in particular model technologies and I think we have to ask the question about whether or not we, and by we I mean those in the US and also in Europe, are happy with the way that genetic medicine is being built. And you, we have now the opportunity to think about technologies that are at an earlier stage, that is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, for example, that I mentioned earlier, and also pharmacogenetics that I also uh, mentioned earlier. And finally, to go back to the larger picture of science and technology development, uh, there are a couple of things that I just want to add. In, in, to start out with, as I said before, I really think that public concern over scientific and technological development isn't going to go down. It's only going to increase at this stage. And so given that, and given the fact that people are more and more invested in scientific and technological development, I think it becomes incumbent upon policymakers and also those of us who are engaged in these kinds of conversations to push for uh, real conversations about the stakes of technological development and the stakes of actually the way that technologies are designed and how implications are actually built into these technologies so that we can build better ones and perhaps mitigate public concern in the future. And these days, you know, there are increasingly efforts towards this. The European Union is trying to do a lot of this work. And in the US, we're starting to do some of it too, but it's very, on a very, very, very small scale, um, perhaps larger in, in the EU. But it's, it's pretty um, minimal at this point. So there's a lot of potential for growth. So I'll stop there, and I look forward to your questions. I can hear you. Uh, I, I have a history of, of, of cancer in our family, particularly uh, the woman's side in our family. I've recently been tested for BRCA1. Assuming I, uh, the test becomes positive, would the next step be for my daughter, who I'm concerned about, take the test also? Uh, I mean, that's a decision that your daughter, you and your daughter would have to make. Assuming Yeah, that would be the logical next step to find out whether or not that particular mutation is um, an issue in your family. Alex? Yeah, thank you for your talk. I have a question about a little bit of the prehistory of how um, uh, the, the BRCA1 and 2 became a standalone technology. Because if you think about it, the information, you know, where those actual samples were coming from was likely coming out of family studies that were likely being done in certain hospitals or certain clinics where they've discovered there were you know, cancer running their family lines. So I think it's really an interesting question to ask, how did that get erased? And then, you know, because 
itself um, that allowed for that, that erasure and kind of and, and the kind of the forgetting of the family history. I think the way to think about it is to remember that the provider of testing in the US now was not um, was only partially engaged in that. I mean, it would be incorrect to say that they were not engaged in those studies because Maria Genetics was born from a scientist from, at the University of Utah, and there's um, a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, it was because of Mormon geneal genealogical records that they were able to find the breast cancer genes in the first place. But they sort of took off from that and, you know, capitalized on what the DNA analysis could provide. So um, some of the stuff I didn't talk about is how Eli Lilly provided Myriad with $10 million to buy rooms of gene sequencing machines so that they could win the race. Um, so, so in that process, right, it becomes about the technical. It becomes about what the genetic code can tell you and less about um, what you know, what the family history is actually saying. And so there's distance there between what's happening in the genetics clinic. It becomes a, a biotechnology company that is capitalizing on this gene sequencing machines and then uh, patenting the genes and then doing what they can to, as quickly as possible, commercialize uh, what they found, right? And the, most seamless process to commercialization is to offer this DNA analysis as a quick consumer product, right? Uh, so, I, I mean, I think that's an important part of it because what I didn't talk about and I do talk about a lot in the book is the other providers of testing in the United States. And I don't want to leave you with the impression that this was the only way that it could have gone in the US. There were actually a number of other uh, testing providers and they offered it in very different ways. And some of them were genetics clinics um, who were very much more tied to questions of family history. There was a biotech company who um, had a, a chief scientific officer who was a clinician herself, so she defined testing in a very different way. So there were very different approaches to testing. Um, I think it was about the corporate, you know, the sort of um, corporate strategy approach that Myriad decided to take that shaped um, the way that they, that erasure process. Joel? I'm going to push you. First of all, congratulations. It's a fantastic book and a fantastic project, and I think it opens up all kinds of important questions. Thanks. I'm going to push you towards one that you might not want to go towards, but... <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and that is, that's where the rubber makes the road. I mean, I want, another way to look at this is that um, we're infatuated with medical technology, that we believe deep in our hearts that science and technology are going to make us healthier and better and live longer. And the, you, you touched briefly on the, you know, various ways of screening for breast cancer and, you know, it's, it surprises no one with any knowledge of the field that if you have a, you know, a machine that finds smaller and smaller and smaller and you have more and more false positives and it's, it's, there's dangers there. One of the dangers is you wind up spending twice as much money for health care as any other uh, right. civilized country and getting results that on a good day with the wind behind us going downhill we're, we're average. Right. Um, on a bad day we're not average. Uh, among, the among the industrialized countries. So in a fantasy world, whoever gets elected president um, turns to you because they- As they will. Totally. It's going to be far to get to Washington. Um, let's say they turn to you and say, what does this book tell us about what our health policy ought to be like going forward? Are there any lessons here that you can draw on that? Any, any tangible lessons? I think, I mean, that's what I was trying to get at a little bit, but I was probably mealy-mouthed on purpose. Um, I think we do have a certain romance with te technological development, in particular when it comes to medicine. And we believe that every new technology, by its very definition, is going to save us. And The question is really whether or not any kind of healthcare reform in any realistic way will ever work if we don't get over that. And I mean that's my that's my cynical reading of this really is that you know we keep talking about it, we keep going over it over and over again. 
But we have a certain romance with technology, which unless we can figure out a way to break that, then I don't think, I don't think there's much hope. Now, I am not, I, I certainly would hope that we can figure out a way to break that. Um, but uh, I'll just tell you this quick vignette of a student that I had um, who uh, came into my office and was saying, well, you know, well, the British healthcare system is worse, obviously, right? And, and I said, well, you know, it depends on what you're looking at. And, and she said, well, you know, I went to Britain on my honeymoon and I was hiking in Wales and I fell and I broke my leg and I was in traction for three weeks and I came back to my physician and my physician um, was shocked at the you know bad techno you know the the age of the techno the brace and how it was such old technology and if she he'd been treated she'd been treated in the US it would have been so much better and she said so that's an example right and i said well so you were treated in britain right and she said yeah I said, well, that wouldn't have happened in the U.S. Um, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I said, and, and, I, and she said, and I, um, I said, so you were also in traction for three weeks, right, in a British hospital, and you were a foreigner from the U.S. That also would not have happened in the U.S., right? Um, and then I asked her how she was doing now, right? What was, how was her leg? And everything was fine. You know? So, and it was only after that conversation that she was like, oh, yeah, maybe. I mean, it was interesting, right? I mean, it, it did not dawn on her that she was treated and was cured and that, you know, that might be something to consider. So what it makes you realize <laughs> is that, and this is something that I think is an issue and I talk about in the book, is that what is a good health outcome is not... Um, obvious and in the US if you look at this case what is defined as a good health health outcome in the US is having access to this technology and it was so interesting to me when I was doing the research I mean the issues around what you would do with the technology were almost absent in the beginning I mean it was all about having access to the technology you know, and there are all these stati st uh, statistics that you probably know better than I do about, you know, how every hospital has to have an MRI in order to compete and stuff like that. I mean, you know, that's because it's about, you know, what a good health outcome is, is getting access to the technology. Right. Nathan. So in the U.S., um, most uh, advocacy groups, patient advocacy groups, were against the uh, commercial provision of BRCA testing. And what Myriad chose to do was to go around them. Um, so what's interesting is that they, I mean, this is not a direct answer to your question, but they, um, John mentioned that one of my articles is entitled Knowledge is Power, which is a, um, you know, a feminist cry, feminist health cry from the 1970s. And, um, Myriad used that tagline um, in their marketing materials, basically to demonstrate their uh, affiliation with the women's empowerment movement. Um, but they didn't have friends in the advocacy community. They sort of tried to take the, you know, take their rhetoric and sort of um, go around them. Um, so that's what happened in the U.S. In Britain, um, they don't have the same tradition of patient advocacy. Um, but patient advocates were involved in, but they were really, I mean, to the extent that patient advocacy groups have ever had a role in the national, influencing the National Health Service, it's been um, advocating ac increased access to services, and uh, that's what they did in this case as well. They tried to increase access to services. So um, I'm not sure in either case they had a deleterious uh, 
effect on the development of the new technology, but they both had sort of interesting and perhaps not entirely expected uh, effects on the development of, of the technology in the two places. Yes. But the knowledge and power is power wouldn't work in Britain, I don't think. I mean, so I mean, a quick summation of what happened was in when Myriad did try to go to Britain to expand its testing service was um, not only was the patent issue, um, you know, sort of as I said, sort of ignored, but the Brits basically said, listen, we don't think your test is very accurate. You know, we define our accurate in terms of the clinical dimensions of the test. You define it in a different way. We don't think it's very accurate. Um, you know, we believe in, you know, we have all these values and your test doesn't adhere to those values, so we think it's a bad test and we think it's an inaccurate test, which, you know, the use of even the word accuracy was pretty interesting in that context. So, um, what Myriad then tried to do was to create sort of a satellite laboratory in Britain, um, which existed for a little while and then it um, collapsed for reasons unrelated to um, their deal with Myriad. So, but since then, um, the uh, a coalition of groups around um, from throughout Europe have uh, challenged Myriad's patents at the European Patent Office and um, were able to get Myriad's patents, most of them revoked except for one small uh, mutation. So Myriad basically can't do anything in Europe at this point. And now there's a lot of hatred towards the company among scientists and physicians and, uh, you know, and patient advocacy groups throughout Europe as well who are involved in these coalitions uh, against the European uh, Patent Office. That's what inspired the stuff that I'm working on now. Um, and so, you know, in those cases, so what I know is that from speaking to clinicians in Britain, there has not been a lot of uptake of the test. To the extent that there has been some uptake of the test, um, there's actually been a number of these variants of uncertain significance or people coming in trying to uh, get uh, interpretation of the test results that they can't, which they can't get otherwise. All of those kinds of things have, have happened there. So um, it's it, you know, people have that option, and if, you know, it is often the case, right, there may be having one family, they may have one family member, um, you know, in the U.S. and one family member in Britain, so they may know about it, but actually, I know of at least one case where um, someone in the U.S. had the test taken, um, got, a, I think, a variant of uncertain significance, and then the sister in Britain was faxed the test result, and then she went to her GP to ask for interpretation of the test result. So, you know, it's, it, yes, technically you could, you know, do that and have, um, you know, write a, a, you know, whatever, 1,500 pound check and, um, and uh, get access to the test, but um, the uptake of that is questionable. And if you're going to ask me about the number of tests that have been sold, I wish I knew, I'm dying to know the answer to that question, but Myriad keeps that information under lock and key. Ah, yes, Canada, totally different, yeah. So um, Canada also um, has uh, um, fought Myriad's patents and been successful. They have their own indigenous testing system um, that is sort of halfway in between. It's slightly more um, uh, lenient in terms of the risk categories um, and than Britain, but it has a similar structure to um, the British system. And I should say that other European systems are pretty similar to that. Um, the French and German systems are, um, are more similar to the British system, um, but they also have some sort of structure of risk assessment and triage, although not as extreme as the British system. So, um, yeah. The one not mentioned happens to be Iceland. Ah, uh, yes. Iceland has a very, very different picture, sociologically and biologically. Namely, virtually every human being in Iceland has had a DNA test. Perhaps not the total, complete everything test, 
Now, uh, doesn't that represent a much more advanced approach because everyone's right is done a clinical trial? Why do we have just clinical trials rather than following every person's health? Well, um, Iceland is a very interesting case. As it sounds like you probably know they um, have a, uh, they tried to develop a genetic database in Iceland that incorporated everybody and that would link the um, DNA information to the medical records. And initially the argument was that Iceland has a homogeneous population and can capitalize on this in the world market by you know, using that homogeneous population and this treasure trove of um, genealogical information to um, find all kinds of uh, gene mutations and gene tests and, and drugs and et cetera. Um, so those are at least a couple of differences between you know, the US and Britain with Iceland is that it's a very homogeneous population with long genealogical records. It's a very small country. Um, and so the kinds of things that might be controversial in the US and in Britain um, are unlikely to raise the same kinds of issues in Iceland, uh, one might think. However, even in the case of Iceland, uh, that project when, um, and it's not clear whether it was simply about Icelandic, um, you know, sort of once people realized what the project was all about, they stopped it, or because of the international scrutiny that emerged uh, in the wake of the decision to engage in that database, uh, they actually stopped the doing that because, so they actually don't have that program anymore. So I'm not sure Iceland is the best case scenario because at the end of the day they too decided that it was a little bit too much of a hot potato. Uh, recently? <laughs> uh, last couple of years? I don't know uh, exactly. I can get back to you on that. John? Yeah, um, okay. Alright, then I'll just take it. Which is, I want to push it on the other side for a minute. And in effect, in a way, take up Myriad's case back to you. Which yeah. Is that, I, I, that especially, um, you know, at, partly to bring out that, that if part of the packaging is around technology, partly as, as you also point out in your work, is around the kind of broader culture of understanding, cultures of relations to authority, and particularly around expert culture. And then here, specifically, I'm thinking about what about a vision of not just genetic testing, but a whole set of testing. Mm -hmm that goes around and outside of physicians as key monitors of that. I mean, to what degree do, does one make another form of argument that people should have the ability and the right to find out if they have high or low cholesterol by having a blood test done on their own initiative, getting the results. Most of the labs do, do, do the analysis to begin with. It's not physicians who are doing the analysis. And in fact, have all kinds of ways of monitoring their own health and behavior in ways that might be cheaper, but also give them a form of power in the system that to this point is not largely still moderated by physicians. Now, as we know, in America, clearly there are, there are enough moments of skepticism toward expert authority in certain limited contexts that that can have an emotional possibility that has had some kind of sway. In Britain, however, you know, with things like with the BSE scare, of course, there have been a number of recent episodes that have also at least caused some doubt about whether expert authority in Britain can be as trusted as it might have been 20 or so years ago. So I'm wondering, I guess, in the first part, what are the ways in which we might see this as another kind of story that has a certain kind of resonance that at least as powerful as the one about the British model, and also the ways in which it brings out sort of trust in experts as being another part of the package that goes together in making this story? Um, so I should preface all of this by saying uh, that my intention is not to demonize Myriad, right? So while it often can come out that way, I think that these are both two systems that emerged for specific reasons in um, particular countries. The extent to which one could work in the other, I think, is limited. Um, I think that Myriad is and to the extent that we think that the Myriad system or the national NHS system are problematic, I don't think that um, either is to blame, that, the, that we as members of a society in which the, you know, these structures and this particular cultural approach exists are the reasons why these technologies exist as they do. Uh, and, and I say that in part because you know, I didn't realize this when I started my 
PhD dissertation, but um, as some of you who know this story or genetic, you know, know anything about genetic testing, probably know Myriad has become, um, has been demonized, has become sort of a cause celeb among those who are against any genetic testing, you know, and it's become um, an outlier. It, it, it's become an outlier case. So a lot of people say, you know, a lot of people critique my stuff and say, well, Myriad's an outlier case. Um, and I, I vehemently disagree with that. I don't think that it's an outlier case at all. And, so, and I don't think it deserves to be demonized, and I don't think, um, and I think that actually it's quite typical. And that sort of leads to my answer to your question, which is that, uh, you know, again, going back to larger uh, questions around healthcare and the provision of healthcare in the US, uh, the New York Times, I think about a year ago, had a really interesting series about the empowered consumer of healthcare and the uh, double edged sword of being that empowered consumer of healthcare. And I think that that's what you see in this case as well. So that's why I said, you know, this is, this is not an outlier, it's actually a pretty um, typical case. And in this case, you have an example of uh, a technology that, as you said, right, I mean, it, it, you know, it, it's absolutely typical for the United States. You um, have, we've been taught, uh, in part, this is the legacy of bioethics, is, you know, the importance of patient autonomy and the importance of patient empowerment. And so, you know, we want to be able to demand access to this technology and we don't want paternalistic physicians telling us what to do, which is, of course, you know, where the British model is a caricature on the other, on the other side, right? Um, but I think we are very accustomed to seeing the drawbacks to the paternalistic approach that we see in the British, because that's we have over the last 20 to 30 years emerged into this, you know, sort of place that uh, valorizes the empowered consumer and the role of the physician as a facilitator. Whereas in the U.S., um, we're not as accustomed, I think, to um, thinking about the problems that arise when you're an empowered consumer. And there are at least and I mean, I, I've sort of talked about a few of them, but I'll, but it bears repeating at least and maybe expanding on. The first is that, um, especially when you're talking about this kind of complicated risk information, you're putting a lot of uh, burden on the uh, consumer to know a lot of information. Uh, you know, we can't assume perfect information, right? So these are, these are people who are going in and being confronted with, you know, oh, well, you know, 30 to 85 percent in average lifetime risk of contracting breast cancer. Well, how do you deal with that piece of information? And, you know, you are often left alone to do that. And if, you ha if you're not going to a specialist and you're going to a primary care physician, they may have limited knowledge about how to help you interpret that kind of information. So I think that that's one of the issues that arises. Now, given that, um, of course, most of the people on this, in this room would deal with this information by, you know, Googling it, right? Googling bracket testing and, you know, asking Google all the answers to your questions and you'd probably get a lot of useful information along with some probably pretty useless information. But you, you would get a lot of information and you'd be able to then process it. But the other thing, and that raises the other question, which is that the assumption of an empowered consumer assumes a certain kind of consumer, an upper middle class, Health, relatively educated consumer who knows how to interpret that kind of risk information, which I think is an unfair uh, assumption to make. And I think those are the, some of the kinds of things that came up in that New York Times article, and I think it's, it's really um, relevant to consider. And again, sort of going back to what I was saying earlier around the construction of a genetic underclass, maybe given the populations that we're talking about who are likely to buy this test, it's fine. But, you know, these are bigger questions around, you know, and there are people who get this kind of information and then, you know, aren't sure what to do with it. And it's not just entirely a socioeconomic question. It has to do with age, right? Someone my age is much more likely to be able to, you know, go and go on Medline and read all kinds of articles about it as my mother is, for example. So I think that's something additional to consider. Thanks for being